to our coffee with, and of course, you know me, uh, Ruby Kendrick. Right. Uh, I am the co-president of the Tyler Smith County League of Women Voters. And of mm -hmm. course, um, you know, we are a nonpartisan grassroots civic organization uh, that encourages um, informed and active participation in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues also, and uh, influences public policy through education and advocacy, which is a big deal. And of course, our overall mission is to defend democracy and uh, empower voters. And um, we have, I'll let each member here of the board introduce themselves to you real quick, and then you can tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll get to our questions. Marilyn. Okay, well, I'll start uh, after Ruby. I'm the other co-president. My name's Marilyn Wills, and we sure appreciate you taking time today to talk to us and to our audience out there about the school district and your position with it. LaRonda? Hello, Mr. Newsom. My name is LaRonda Hamilton, and I am vice president of community relations. So glad that you were able to join us today. Okay. Indeed. Oh, Good we can't afternoon. hear you, Dee. Good afternoon, <laughs> artist. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm surprised I didn't pass you today at Pete, but I, I know. know. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're both working and volunteering over there. I'm sure we'll talk a little oh. bit about that later. But I'm Denise Pendleton. I am the immediate past president of Delta Sigma Theta and a very, very good friend of the League of Women Voters. <laughs> That's right. Yes, she is a very, very good friend. Uh, we don't know what we'd do without her, for sure. Okay. Uh, but at any rate, just give a couple of minutes. Uh, give us a one, two minute uh, introduction about yourself, uh, okay. if you don't mind. Okay. I don't know how far back to go, but well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, I, I've been in Tyler now for 40 years. Uh, so I should be a Tylerite, but I know Tylerites have this thing about Tyler people being yeah. born here. At the Coast of <laughs> anyway, I consider myself a Tylerite. I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Texas, Northeast Texas. I uh, went to Pittsburgh High School, graduated from there, went to Stephen F. Austin State University, where Ruby went a little before me. Uh, but uh, I and my master's there, bachelor's was in biology, minor in chemistry and sociology, and got my master's in social planning uh, there at the physical therapy school. Following Ruby again, but didn't know her. We both went to Galveston, UTMB, uh, physical mm -hmm. therapy school. And uh, I graduated from there in 1982 and moved here to Tyler. Uh, been actively involved in the community ever since I moved here. Uh, Worked originally at Mother Francis and was affiliated with Mother Francis most of my career, but I did uh, do some private practice for about five and a half years in sports medicine. Did uh, uh, home health for about five and a half years also. Uh, did some nursing home for about five and a half years. <laughs> I did five year, in, five, five, five year intervals kind of. And uh, finished up with uh, primarily doing rehab at uh, Health South. Now it's Trinity Mother Francis uh, Rehabilitation Hospital. I was over the physical therapy department there for about 17 years. And then I went into their home health. And that's where I finished my career about five years ago. I retired uh, and it had become Encompass at that time, Encompass Home Health. Uh, Basically, I'm married, have two children that are grown, and they have two children each. Hmm. Uh, my daughter lives in Houston. My son lives here in Tyler. Uh, what else? What else do you want to know? Well, that covers it. I think <laughs> the personal part, but um, we have a lot of fun questions to ask you. So. <laughs> well, that's good. I, I love yeah. questions. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been on the school board? Uh, uh, probably two years, I would say, going okay. into my third year. After okay. this next year, I should be up for re-election if I'm going to run. Okay. All right. Well, I'll start with the first question. Um, can you share your thoughts about the unique magnet select schools in the district, including the early college high school 
uh, that are included on this year's bond election. Okay. Okay. I, I, I think that TISD, starting off, TISD has an extremely excellent school district, okay? I don't think that, I know that in the city of Tyler, there's not a district that actually can compare to it. Um, including private school and charter schools. Hmm. Uh, statistically on the test, TISD always supersede those uh, private and charter schools as well. Uh, so we have an excellent school system and with excellent opportunities. And the magnet programs are just a portion of that. Well, we have several other programs that I'm finding out even just from visiting campus that's campus oriented that we're involved in that a lot of people are not familiar with. Oh. So uh, the magnet programs in particular are excellent. Once again, it gives the students an opportunity to do specialized things at an earlier age. Uh, I think that it's an excellent opportunity. Uh, one of the programs that we started, and I don't know if you consider it a magnet program or not, is the program in which we uh, a dual language where individuals can start in kindergarten mm -hmm. and they have their classes are bilingual English and Spanish. And they start, if they start out in the program in kindergarten, they can go all the way through high school in that program. And they will be fluent in Spanish by the time they graduate. Wow. Um, and, it, and it's unfortunate a lot of our people are not taking advantage of that. But that's just one of the programs that's really not pushed as far as uh, people being aware of within the district. Now the magnet programs, yes, they, they know magnet schools and things of that nature, but we have a lot of programs that's really not publicized uh, generally that within the district that are excellent. Hmm. And, the, and the, now going back to early college, I think early college is, uh, once again, it's one of the best, our early college program is one of the best in the state. I think, you know, within the state, we ranked, and I hate to give rankings, but I, I think we were in like number 11 or something like that in the state. Uh, we have an excellent program, and that program has evolved over the years since its existence. Uh, now I want to say it's about mm, four or five years old, and we have graduated quite a few kids, uh, youth that are graduating with their associate degree and high school degree at the same time. Uh, early college is it's extremely unique program in that you have the kids that's able to go there and in addition to completing their high school requirements, they're taking college credit at the same time and they are doing it well. At the same time, we, we allow them to also tutor other kids that's on that campus that's not necessarily in that. Well, how is all of that impacted with the bond? What is the bond all about? The bond is about moving it from the location currently. Early College is currently on the old Stewart campus. The bond, bond will allow them to have a building on the CTC campus out by the Career and Technology Center uh, mm -hmm. on Errol Campbell Parkway. It will be located next door to that, and it will. They will have their own facility, which is a larger facility and more up-to-date equipment and everything else, uh, so that we can expand the program as well. They will be on that campus all day long. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for the answer. Okay. So my question is: What mechanisms does the district have in place? or plan to put in place to encourage students from varied backgrounds and different schools to interact? Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I completely follow the question. Uh, well, I, students from various backgrounds to enter what? Yes, one, want to interact. The, what mechanisms does the district have in place or plan to put in place to encourage students from varied backgrounds and different schools to interact. Uh, one thing that we um, talked about before was there was a, a district-wide middle school dance. And uh, the question was uh, if, if more things like that uh, could be on the horizon. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I, 
the 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 opportunities for the kids to be involved with any of the programs within the district are are open to anyone. Uh, any kid can participate in a magnet program. They they have that opportunity. They can participate in any programs throughout the district by making that selection when the times are appropriate. Usually the year before, uh, like like this time of the year. They're, they're making their decisions about courses for next year. So they have the opportunity, if they choose to go to a magnet program, to make that selection early on. It's open to all the kids. They all are aware, to, aware of it, opportunity. So no, no kids are eliminated. Now, there are kids that have preferences. The teachers or the campuses can direct kids and based on testing as to how they think they should go. Uh, but kids have the opportunity to make that choice. Uh, now, as far as specific criteria for each magnet program, I'm not exactly sure about that, but I know that they do have the opportunity, okay? So I have a follow-up to that. Um, so no matter where I live in Tyler, mm -hmm. I can choose the school that I go to. Is that what you're basically saying? I, you, you can select the school, that, especially magnet programs, special programs, you can. If it's mm -hmm. not a special program and just regular attendance, uh -huh. there is there are districts that you are in. Okay, all right, well, thank you. All right. So the school board elected positions are nonpartisan. What does that mean to you, both in your role, your role as a school board member and your role as a community leader? Well, I, I, I strongly agree that they should be nonpartisan. I, I think that when you talk about the district and the concern and the emphasis that we're on there for, it, has, it should have nothing to do with politics. So I think it should be nonpartisan. Uh, and I think that we should always be concerned about our kids and what they're getting. I think that I'm glad that my position is a nonpartisan position because basically I don't know what my political status is right now. <laughs> and I, I say that because the parties have changed so much. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I'm somewhere in the middle, you know? So I, I think that it should be, I don't think that it should have an effect on a local district. Unfortunately, uh, at the state and federal level, there is a lot of politics involved, which is uh, a hindrance from my perspective because they, they, they make decisions based on political party in, instead of based on need. Uh, so it becomes a, 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 when we look at the state level and how they go about making decision on funding, et cetera. And in return, it does affect the district that perspective, but on a local level or whatever, I, I think it should be nonpartisan. Yeah. Agree. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, what do you see as the largest issues that will impact Tyler ISD students in the next five years? And what actions are the school is the school board taking to address those if you all have had that strategic well, planning conversation. With, with the past two and almost three years of COVID, the biggest challenge from my perspective as a trustee is the academics. Uh, I think that it's definitely been affected. You know, we, we are doing much better academically in the city of Tyler than we were 20 years ago when I, uh, when we first started making some significant changes. Uh, so we've come a long way and I, and I have recognized that a lot and I, but I'm not one to put on blinders. I'm not one to accept, uh, I guess, meteorocracy. I expect the best. And especially when you have the capabilities of doing that. Therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm seen as being relatively critical of, of the district from that perspective, because I have high expectations. Our district before COVID, we were a B-rated district. And one of the things I said in the board meeting was that I expect them to be an A-rated district. 
uh, because I think we have the staff and faculty uh, and the capabilities of doing it. And I think that we have the resources to do that. So when I think five years from now, the biggest thing is gonna be recovering from the loss uh, in the kids being at home uh, during COVID and falling behind when we already had a group of students that were behind and they were out as well as everybody else and they got farther behind. So that's one of my things. It's really trying to make sure that we can close some of these uh, achievement gaps that exist uh, within the district uh, so that we can get our kids where they need to be uh, academically. I have a follow-up question about uh, the shortages of teachers. Oh, wow. how, is that, how is that being addressed? Okay, we are a district of innovation, which basically means that we can hire teachers that are not quote unquote certified, don't have to have the state certificate, teacher certification uh, that's required. And basically there is a problem of shortage. And that's one of the reasons that we became a district of innovation so that we could try to fill those vacancies within the district. Uh, and so we can hire teachers that are not certified and they doing this process, uh, they are supposed to be working on a certification and we allow time for that. So over a period of time, our desire is that all those teachers become certified. Uh, but by that time, especially within the next few years, we were told this past week that there are some legislature being put statewide that whether you are a district of innovation or not, you, uh, the state is saying that teachers may not have to be certified. And if, and if they're hired at a level of uncertification, uh, they're not certified when they're hired on, there will be a grace period similar to what we're doing for them to get their certification. But because there's such a shortage, that may not, the certification may go away. Okay. Hmm. And that's politics. Okay. So, so once again, politics get involved, politics change things. Is that the best thing or not? Hmm. No. Okay. Interesting. Okay. I think I have the next one. Mm -hmm. How have the star test disruptions in the last two years changed yeah. how the district evaluates teachers? and how the board evaluates itself. Okay, star test evaluation associated with teachers. I, I don't, from my perspective, okay, I don't think the teachers are evaluated as much as the students are. Uh, I believe in accountability across the board. Uh, I that somehow, there should be some accountability for the STAR test and related to the teacher and the performance of their students. And, their, uh, and I think that, I don't know right now if that's actually being done within this district uh, as far as the teachers being as accountable as their students. Uh, I, would, I think it's good to tie the two. I think it's good to monitor it. But then there are other factors also that go into play. Uh, not only does, you know, the testing within the district, but uh, the other factors as far as being able to control the classroom, how they relate to their, gosh, really, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I gotta turn this off here. Okay, how they relate to the principal as well as their co-workers. Uh, how they are able to, if they're continuing to progress, once again, I, I believe that teachers should be growing. Uh, they should not become stagnant. So I think there are a lot of factors that, that come into play when we talk about testing and, and teachers' results. I think it should be a part of that teacher's evaluation. No. Is it now? I'm not exactly sure in how much. The district, as far as the trustees and STAR, we are not accountable by any means uh, to star. The only individual that's accountable, that should be accountable from my perspective, are the administrators. 
we do have administrators that work with each campus. And, and I think somehow those administrators are quote unquote, the experts in, in administration. So those individuals are working with a particular campus and their job is to make sure that campus is getting what they need and being successful. So once again, you know, I think that those individuals that mid-management position should be somehow, their evaluation should be somehow tied into that uh, as well. Uh, so, and even to the point, depending on how the district's going as a whole, that goes up the ladder all the way up. I think it should be considered uh, all the way up to the superintendent. Now, we are elected individuals, so we are not as accountable for that as the administrators. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, back around to me. <laughs> what kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts are happening around the district? That's a good question. Uh, the bigger minority and looking at the district, they, I, I think they take it in consideration. Uh, I don't know if there's a big effort to recruit more minorities. From my perspective, our district is uh, almost 50% student-wise, almost 50% Hispanic, 28% uh, percent African-American, and the rest are uh, Caucasian or other, okay? So roughly 70% of our, our student body is minority, okay? So do we see that being reflected in the hierarchy of administration? Uh, no, okay. Well, do we see it in teachers? No. Uh, I, don't, I don't see enough. I think it's important for in the students to see individuals that look like them in the classroom. Educators, uh, and I've had this problem with educators for a long time in regards to how they do that. They don't see the importance of the person that's taking the lead being somebody that looked like the person that's listening, okay? So, so educators tend to say that all they're concerned about is having a good educator in front of that person. Uh, so I feel differently, of course. Uh, I feel like there should be more minorities within the district. Uh, I think that there should be efforts to recruit more minorities, and we do, okay? We recruit more Hispanics, uh, Spanish-speaking, because it's essential that we have Spanish-speaking uh, teachers because we have students that can't speak English, mm -hmm. especially at the lower levels. So we do recruit uh, Spanish-speaking individuals, uh, and we, we do pay incentives. We, we do those things for the Spanish speaking individuals, which is, uh, we have to, and I'm glad we do because we definitely, uh, but a lot of those individuals, once again, are individuals that are not certified at the time of their starting being employed with the district. Uh, from the African-American perspective, I don't see us recruiting African-Americans. We go to uh, the, uh, I can't think of the term, where they go to the campus and they recruit them and they, and they do the sales pitch and all that. They go to the health fair or job fairs. Uh, on the African-American uh, historically uh, black campuses and try to recruit, but it's not, I don't think there are any incentives being offered. And like now we just talked about the shortage. So if I'm a, young African-American teacher coming out of college and I can go to Dallas and I can come to Tyler and the pay grade is a lot different, mm -hmm. I'm likely to go to Dallas unless I have reasons to come to Tyler, right. okay? So, so do we do anything to encourage more minorities, African-Americans or, or others to come? I haven't seen it and maybe ignorance on my part, a lack of knowledge on my part, 
but I don't see a concerted effort in that aspect, looking at ethnic groups per se. Uh, various Spanish, yes, we do. We do active recruiting for that. But ethnic groups recruiting, I haven't seen and I don't know of it very much. Do you know if our salaries are competitive around the state? From what I understand, our salaries are competitive in some areas, okay? Uh, and when you say salaries, most of the time people think about the, uh, the teachers mm -hmm. and uh, the principals. And I think about salary competitive across the board for all employees. Our salaries for our uh, like custodial staff and, and individuals that's ancillary, ancillary to the, the regular services, they have not been competitive from my perspective. We have increased them some recently because we have to, because we can't fill the positions, yeah. okay? Uh, because the salaries have not been competitive. And I, I, so when we look at the, the I'd say the, the jobs within the district that only require maybe a high school education, uh, they're not competitive. And they're not competitive. I say they're not competitive in enough that you can't attract people to those positions and maintain them there. We have a shortage uh, in those positions most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you say our salaries competitive, I think that our, our teachers and principal salaries are, are very competitive. But when we look at the other services, high school education and things of that nature, individuals that we employ within the district, it's not as competitive as it should be. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Well, Mr. Newsom, thank you for sharing some really um, interesting points uh, with us about the school district and your part in it. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with everyone about? what you're doing or what the city's doing? Mm, not really. I, 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 <laughs> I'm still <laughs> learning. So I, I'm, I'm very opinionated and I, and I try not to do that. I try to be objective because I, I do look at things from a very objective standpoint. Uh, by nature, I'm just a planner. So I always look for areas of improvement. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm not, satisfied with with status quo i expect i expect excellence and to work in that direction and that's almost with anything i'm involved with uh, i am just that type of person so I, I i'm always looking for ways to improve to make things better um, and that's basically what i'm looking at from my perspective in, in tisd uh, i'm looking how we can be a better district I'm looking for us to be an A district within the next uh, few years. Uh, we just re-implemented the, the testing within the district so uh, after COVID. So I'm looking for some improvement. And that's my biggest thing. I'm looking for continued improvement across the board at all levels uh, within organizations. Uh, and I think that we've come an extremely long way uh, from where we were 20 years ago. And one of the things that we did 20 years ago, which had really made a difference, and we have to continue to, to remember that, we didn't have a maintenance plan within our district. And we take three cents out of every dollar now uh, and put it into maintenance. So we do have a, a very good maintenance budget within the district uh, to keep our buildings up to date and to expand our buildings, to buy new equipment and, and things of that nature so that our buildings don't look like they did 20 years ago. Uh, and that's what this bond issue is. The last two things that we're doing is to get all our school campuses up to the same level. And then we can concentrate on some other things uh, that, that we can continually to improve on. But the bond issue is will allow us to have all our schools basically all the most of them will be new or renovated, uh, and that should not be an issue if we planned well. 
<laughs> okay, and we'll see, we'll see in the future <laughs> how well we planned. Uh, but it has been 20 years. So some of the schools that were built early on, they may be reaching their limit and it may need to do some expansion, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, so that, that's basically it. I, I'm, 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 I'm pro-education, pro-public education, because they do a good job, uh, uh, for the, especially when you talk about cost. So uh, that's about it. Well, thank you for, um, number one, your work at the school district. We really appreciate that. And also thank you for joining us. And we are going to be placing this on YouTube and on Facebook. So a lot of people hopefully will hear your message and hear the answers to your questions. That's fine. I'm, I don't mind saying it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate mm -hmm. the opportunity. And I've been a, a admirer of the League of Women Voters for some time. I really thought about becoming a part of it uh, okay. years ago. Well, we, yeah. we've had this conversation oh, a lot. Yeah, we, we, we had the conversation. $75. But, but <laughs> you know, that, that was back when I was really, really involved in the community. Now I'm retired, so I'm very selective as to how I use my time. So, uh, <laughs> very smart. So, very smart. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I still support you, and I, I and I, I like to attend all your forums. I think y'all doing an excellent job with the information, giving information out, and and I really appreciate that from my perspective. So uh, you have another admirer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks for coming. Thanks.